Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our sustainability webinar for November. Can you believe it? End of November. Um, so we're looking at the greenhouse gas protocol. We're measuring scope three emissions, and today it's part two of that scope three emission discussion. Um, in part one last month, we looked at upstream emissions, and today we're looking at downstream emissions. So welcome to our webinar. Uh, as always, I'm joined by Dylan Byrne, who's a sustainability and ESG partner, also based uh, here in Melbourne. So good morning, Dylan. Morning, Elena, and morning to everyone on the call. Thanks for joining. Maybe we should talk about the amazing event we had last night. That that will be a good one. Yeah, that was that was incredible. Yeah, we had uh, uh, some fantastic speakers from the retail sector talking to us about the various things that they're doing in their own businesses around sustainability and um, very, very inspiring. And I guess the thing that shone out for me was the leadership that these people brought to their organisations and not telling everyone what to do, but actually instilling a, a, a momentum and a, and a real excitement factor amongst their team so that they could almost be part of the process, not just dragging along everyone with them. So um, it was pretty cool. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we had a, a presenter and we had four panelists and, and as Dylan said, it was quite amazing how um, they were all from various retailers, but it was amazing how it often comes back to people and trying to help people um, and also mm. the people in the business who want to do the right thing. So, you know, that's been quite amazing. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay our respects to elders past and present. And we extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Um, we also wanted to share our BDO sustainability report with you. Now, in 2022, we published our inaugural sustainability report, and in 2023, um, the second one. And we follow the World Economic Forum IBC framework, and we look at the four pillars across people, planet, prosperity, and principles of governance. Now, a big change in this report is this year we've managed to include, and you'd all be very interested in that, we've managed to include our carbon footprint. Um, so if you look at our report and you can download the report there, there's a button there, you'll see our carbon footprint for um, 2022 and 2023. So last year we couldn't make the deadline for the 2022 report because the calculation was only done by January this year. And um, so we've put in 2022 as our baseline. We managed to get 2023 done by end of October. So we've included that as well. And you can see the change. So we're very proud of this report and especially proud of the fact that we've got our carbon footprint included in the report. It's a good example of how you could disclose your carbon footprint. Um, our sustainability webinar series is running to an end as the year is also running to an end. Um, so next month in December, on the 13th of December, so it's in just two weeks, we're looking at the greenhouse gas protocol and we are exploring decarbonisation strategies. So in the first five webinars, when we looked at the greenhouse gas protocol, we were setting boundaries, we were measuring scope one, scope two and scope three. And then once you've got that baseline, the key thing is to then set targets, continue to measure your carbon footprint against those targets. So next month's webinar will be a really good webinar wrapping up the Greenhouse Protocol for uh, 2023. I also would like to invite all of you um, to provide some feedback to Dylan and I on topics you would like us to cover next year. So we are busy putting together our webinars for 2024. Um, there will be one, one a month again. We've got the dates ready, but at this stage we still discussing the topic. So if there's any particular topics you want us to visit, please send me an email, happy to do that. So for today's agenda, we will look at some of the latest Australian developments 
Um, and there's been a number of developments recently, as always, every month, a lot of developments. We will do a bit of a recap of our previous greenhouse gas webinars over the last five months. We will look at collecting scope three data and in particular, the downstream data, where last month we looked at the upstream scope three data. Then we'll pull it all together and discuss intensity factors. And you'll see, I'll provide an extract from the BDO Australia Sustainability Report. You'll see our intensity factors for 2022 and 23, and what that would mean for you if you're a client of BDO. Then we'll look at the importance of engaging your suppliers and customers. And finally, how can we help? So that's the agenda for today. If we move on to the latest Australian developments, in the very first slide, it's a little bit of a summary. Um, Shannon, if you don't mind the next slide, we've got a, a little bit of a summary of the uh, Australian developments and that the AASB has issued exposure draft SR1. Now, this is a weird exposure draft to say the least because it's incorporating proposed changes to IFRS S1 and IFRS S2 as well as a reference standard. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a weird mixture. Um, what makes it stranger, in my opinion, is when they refer to IFRS S1, the AASB is actually proposing to limit the scope of IFRS S1 to only look at climate-related financial disclosures. Now, as we discussed previously, IFRS S1 at a global level is a attempt to ask organizations to reach out to stakeholders and identify what topics are important to the entity's stakeholders. So it's a really broad standard. It says do a materiality assessment or stakeholder engagement, speak to these stakeholders, understand what they would like you to focus on within sustainability, and then report relevant information. And then they say, yes, IFRS S2 is looking specifically at climate, and there will be future standards looking at various topics. So I find it extremely strange that in Australia, we're not doing the reaching out to stakeholders, we're not identifying relevant topics, but absolutely from the start, just making this about climate. So there are significant changes to IFRS S1 within the Australian environment. Um, there's also a number of proposed changes to IFRS S2. Um, and, you know, before I look, I've discussed those on the next slide, what worries me most about this exposure draft is that Australia is moving in a fairly different direction than the International Sustainability Standards Board. And if we look at um, a global environment and if we look at Australian entities trying to attract global investors, Australian entities being subsidiaries of global entities, um, I, I think it will be really difficult for Australian entities to both comply with Australian standards in Australia and also meet the information needs of those global investors, um, global parents, etc. So I think it is more onerous on Australian entities. Um, the other thing is I'm, I'm a bit worried that we are creating a similar problem to the problem we created in 2005 when Australia first adopted IFRS accounting standards, uh, where again, we had a lot of differences to these standards. Um, and then by 2009, we realized it's not workable and we removed all the differences and we went back to the good old fashioned IFRSs. So I'm fearful that we're gonna walk down a similar path here, which is time consuming, wasting our time. Um, so we have an opportunity to provide feedback to the AASB um, and the closing date for that is on the 1st of March and we will be providing feedback more or less in line in, in what I've just discussed. Um, if there are other concerns or even support for this ED, please reach out, happy to consider. Um, so if you look at that ASRS1, which is changes to IFRS S1, 
the biggest issue, and I've put it in yellow so nobody can miss it, uh, Dillard, is that um, they're limiting the scope from looking at all potential sustainability topics to just looking at climate-related disclosures. Then on the next slide, um, I've tried to highlight um, some of the modifications to the content of um, IFRS 1 and S2, but in particular S2. And at the top, you'll see there's a link to an article that we've written, BDO Australia has written, um, and it was included in Corporate Reporting Insights last month. Um, so if you look at this, you'll see, um, you know, that, that the modifications, they say if there are no material climate-related risks and opportunities that could reasonably expect it to affect the entity's prospects, an entity must disclose this fact and explain how it arrived at this conclusion. So this is again more onerous. So if it's not material, why is it not material? If not, why not? Um, then also the scope of, of the Australian version of IFRS S2 is limited to climate related risks and opportunities related to climate change. So it does not deal with other climate related emissions. So ozone depleting emissions um, that are not greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then um, important, they also say that the greenhouse gases must be converted into a CO2 equivalent value using the global warming potential values from the same intergovernmental panel on climate change assessment report as that applying under the Paris Agreement and the Enger um, Act 2007 and related regulations. Um, so really an alignment with the Enger Act. Um, and then in red, I've put there, before referring to foreign measurement frameworks, entities must prioritise applying relevant methodologies in the Enger scheme legislation as the default methodologies for measuring greenhouse gas emissions. So in Australia, we're saying first ENGA, and then you can go and look at other frameworks, which that is not what is the case within um, IFRS S2. So again, how are entities going to navigate that? Uh, then on the next slide, some additional modifications. Um, if reasonable and supportable data related to the current reporting period is not available, to the entity at the reporting date without undue cost or effort, entities can disclose their scope three greenhouse gas emissions using data for the immediately preceding reporting period. Again, different to IFRS S2. Um, and then um, entities that will be required by the Corps Act to prepare climate related financial disclosures must undertake climate resilience assessments against at least two possible future states. And one of these future states must be consistent with the most ambitious global temper temperature goals set out in the Climate Change Act 2022. Um, so that is the 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. And they must disclose their market-based scope to emissions with transition relief for the first three annual reporting periods. So you can see quite significant, these are not small, significant changes to IFRS S2. Um, and therefore my concern is around entities trying, you'll be regulated to comply with these Australian versions, but there will also be a market demand to, apply, uh, to uh, um, comply with IFRS S1 and S2. Uh, I would have liked to see international convergence um, alignment actually exactly the same, to be fair, similar to what we have in IFRS accounting standards. So that's a bit of Australian developments. Um, we'll come back to this. We are working through this. We'll put in an, uh, a comment letter. Um, the other thing to look at is the potential effective dates have been adjusted slightly. And that is, um, you know, the effective date depends on government's final timeline for making these climate-related disclosures mandatory in Australia. And at this stage, we have no timeline for other sustainability disclosures. The only thing we've got is a timeline for climate-related disclosures. Um, and what they've said, latest thinking, for group one entities, um, the really large entities, and we flagged it in previous webinars, 
It will be annual periods beginning on or after 1 July 2024, where again IFRS S1 and S2 are talking about annual periods beginning on or after 1 January 2024. Um, and you might say, Aleta, it's only six months. What's the difference? The difference is if you've got a 31 December year end, um, in Australia, we will not be looking at 31 December 2024 disclosures. The first possible disclosure would be 30 June 2025, because that will be the first period beginning on or after 1 July 2024. And so I think that's important to, to consider. Um, and then for Group 2 entities, it will be 30 June 2027, and Group 3 entities, 30 June 2028. Now, again, these are proposed dates. Um, I think there will still a number of things happen, um, but just so you, you've got these dates, um, it's a bit of an update on dates that we've previously shared. Um, let's move on to a recap of some of the previous um, greenhouse gas webinars. <clears throat> so if we look at the steps in identifying and calculating our emissions, five steps. So we identify the sources of emissions, um, then in step two, we select a calculation approach. In step three, and that's where we've spent a lot of our time in these webinars, we collect the data and we choose emission factors. In step four, we apply calculation tools. And then in step five, we roll up the data to a corporate level. So in each and every webinar, we come back to these are the five steps to identify and calculate our emissions. Then on our next slide, um, if we estimate our emissions, the basic equation that we use is we gather that activity data, we apply the relevant emission factors, and that will give us our tons of emissions, and then we multiply it with our global warming potential in order to get to a carbon dioxide equivalent of emissions. Because not all activity data, if you multiply it with an emissions factor, would actually get you directly to a carbon dioxide equivalent. So we might have to um, add that global, global warming potential as well. Then on the next slide, um, scope one, bit of an overview. We had stationary combustion, mobile combustion, fugitive emissions and process emissions. Um, and maybe I should just pause here. One of the differences between greenhouse gas protocol and the ENGA Act is actually in scope one, um, because in scope one, the ENGA Act also include waste, which if you look at the greenhouse gas protocol would sit into scope three. So there are some subtle differences between greenhouse gas protocol and ENGA Act. And, and, and that's partly why I'm a bit concerned about the different frameworks to measure and report um, the greenhouse gases. So just as a, uh, FYI, but we'll come back to that. So we've looked at greenhouse gas protocol and we've looked at these four scopes of emissions. If we look at the next one, um, scope two, we looked at purchased electricity, steam, heating and cooling um, and, you know, um, and how you would go about that. Um, maybe the next slide, a bit of an overview of the various uh, scope three emissions. And as we said last month, we looked at the first eight categories, the upstream scope three emissions. And this time we're looking at the downstream scope three emissions. And we'll be discussing categories nine to 15. Thank you. So collecting scope three data. Um, and I think Dylan, this is where I first of all hand over to you to talk about category mm -hmm. and nine to 12. Thanks, Aleta. Um, and um, I guess uh, this is a general ob observation. Um, I think some of these categories might well cause people to kind of scratch their head and say, well, you know, why do I have to you know, look at this? And I think it's fair to say that to date, because scope three is an area where there is a fair bit of uh, discretion, uh, we're not seeing a lot of these downstream categories come into play. But I think, um, you know, as uh, momentum builds and, and this becomes more commonplace, I think it will come on board, particularly when people are, or businesses are wanting to know their life cycle. 
and um, I guess we relate back to the, the event last night. Uh, if you take retail, there's very much an interest in, okay, well, if I sell something to a customer, whether it's clothing or white goods or food, um, then I might have an interest in what happens with that good or service as it continues on with its life cycle. So um, I think at this, at this point in time, it's just really good to understand how this side of things works. Uh, personally, I find it really interesting because it actually says, well, what happens after I do my bit? Um, but um, I guess on the flip side, uh, there's a fair bit of um, variability built into this and, and definitely the, the protocol allows for the reality of, hey, I might not be able to calculate or measure or collect data to support some of these calculations. So as you'll see, there will be some um, get out of jail cards, if you like, so that you do as much as you can, but there'll always be a, a fallback. And the other thing you'll notice in, in this is that some of these um, next categories are mirror images of their cousins in the first eight categories. So quite often uh, something in nine to 15 will re relate back to uh, another scope three and say, well, you're measuring a different part of the life cycle, but look at the, the way that you measure uh, that. And, and you'll see some of these things as we go through now. So um, the first category, category nine, is talking about downstream transportation and distribution. Uh, and there's um, a bit of a distinction there between um, distribution that we control versus um, distribution that we uh, are outsourcing. Um, but we're only really looking at, um, in this category, what happens after the reporting entity, which is us, um, is paid for its product to be produced and distributed. So um, this is very much a, we've, we've produced the product, what happens next? And then in some cases we'll control the, the, the trucks or the, the mode of transport, or in, in a lot of cases, we'll be outsourcing that to, to someone else. Thanks, Shannon. And as, as we've seen in the other categories, um, the, the protocol's great, it's got diagrams, it's got examples. So, you know, whenever I go to the, the protocol and I'm trying to solve a problem, it's not just a bunch of words that I have to then figure out what, what's going on. The, the practical examples, you know, really bring it to life and make it a bit easier. So, you know, in this particular instance, um, if, if the company does, does not pay for transportation, of sold products to the retailer, or it outsources it, then it's going to have its scope one and two. Uh, but in terms of transporting it to someone else, that's going to be a scope three for us. It's not going to be our diesel scope one for our trucks. It's going to be diesel in someone else's trucks that becomes our scope three. And then um, you've also got um, the distribution through the retailer, which is another element of this, this category nine. Um, but as you can see, um, if the company is paying for the transportation, which is the bottom arrow, then our scope three becomes different. It's, it's a category four, not a category nine. So it's really important to understand what does our supply chain look like from a logistics point of view, and that will determine which, which uh, categories we apply in the, in the protocol. Thank you. Um, and, and we'll have this concept of primary data and secondary data. That's where, you know, try and get the information to the best quality that you can find. And that might be, you know, really that activity specific data. Um, I think I mentioned this last time, but more and more, uh, particularly in logistics, uh, companies are able to provide fairly accurate emission calculations for their customers. So I've got clients that get a report from Australia Post every year saying, okay, you're we, we deliver mail and parcels, et cetera, on, on your behalf for the last financial year. Here's the data, here's the emission carbon footprint from the, the distribution that you've engaged us to do. So for this particular category, it's pretty common to be able to find good data, which is great because it, it can be a big one, particularly when you're shipping parcels all the time and that's a core part of your business. Um, but in the absence of that, we have some fallback. So, you can also look at some distance um, type of um, data uh, and then you can apply some, some um, measurements or some factors or some emission factors to that. Uh, and then as an example of a secondary data, it's looking at um, 
industry averages and national average emissions. So that's really, a, as you can see, that's not going to give you a very accurate outcome, but at least it's got it's something. And this is all presupposing that this category is material. So you've done your materiality assessment, you've determined that in our supply chain, this is a material emission, therefore we need to look at it. Um, so, you know, you've been through a few steps already and then we have this fallback, okay, it, it is material, but we know that we can rely on some industry averages at the, at the end of the day if we can't get um, other data. Thanks. Um, in terms of um, category 10, um, this is the, uh, the situation where we've produced something, but it's going downstream and then it's being used um, it, or it's being processed um, by another party. And um, this also includes sales to intermediate um, or intermediate products. So this is where you, know, you might be selling a component uh, that goes into a piece of equipment that someone else is producing. And um, you, know, you can see there it's talking about further processing or transformation or inclusion in another product before use. So we're looking at the emissions that are from that processing uh, part of the supply chain. And, um, and we, we're trying to, I guess, capture that. And we're looking at um, the differentiation though between um, the production of the component versus the, the processing of the intermediate product. Shannon. Um, we've got a nice little flow chart there and it's talking about um, significant contributions to emissions and uh, we've got a bit of a flow chart there saying, you know, can the customer provide energy or GHG data? Keep in mind that when we're talking about some of these scope three emissions, we're only capturing the scope one and two of the next person in the supply chain. So that's what we're talking about energy or GHG data. Um, so, you know, we've got the fallback of an average data method, which is the little green box in the bottom there. However, if we've got sophisticated um, customers um, downstream, and this is where you've got this differentiation between suppliers and customers. Uh, we can exert control over suppliers. We can actually say, well, if you want to supply to us, you know, you've got to give us some data. We're a little bit more difficult when you're downstream, so, or, sorry, someone's downstream of you or they're a customer, they might want, so we don't want to share that information with you, hence the fallback of the, the industry average data. But you know, if you've got good relationships with people who are downstream from you, then you know, it may well help them to, they share information with you and you share information with them. And uh, we had a good example of that in the um, discussion last night around um, shopping centres and landlords and tenants and, and very much a, a relationship approach of let's work together and get a good outcome as opposed to just doing our own thing in isolation. So, um, you know, I think we'll see more and more of this. It might seem a little bit uh, hard to fathom how you get that information, but I think we're going to just be seeing much more transparency between parties, particularly on you know, non-financial information where it's not kind of as commercial uh, as, as some of this other stuff. Thanks, Shannon. Um, and as we said before in that flow chart, you know, ideally we'd get site-specific energy usage uh, or emissions, but we've got the fallback there of the industry averages. Thanks. Um, category 11 is one of those ones where I think, you know, this is going to be quite difficult uh, depending on who your customers are. So if you're a, um, a B to C type of business, um, then your product could be sold to you know, any number of consumers. They could use it any number of ways. They might wear a piece of clothing once or they might wear it, you know, a hundred times and keep it for 20 years. Um, so that's definitely an issue for the retail sector. Um, whereas if you're selling something to a business customer, maybe there's a little bit more uh, ability to predict what their usage patterns are. So a bit of a uh, case by case um, scenario under this category. Thanks. And you'll see a theme here, you know, try and get data from your customers or your consumers. If not, think about it. Um, and there's a quite interesting flow chart. I think it's in the next slide. Thanks, Shannon. Um, sorry, no, it isn't. But we might provide that in, in the send out. It's actually um, talking about 
making assumptions around how many times a, a product is used, how often does it use electricity or not, um, those types of things. You can actually build up a nice little formula to say, okay, if I sell this thing, I'm going to make some assumptions and, you know, no one's going to get in trouble for having a go at that and including it if there's a reasonableness around it. Uh, it might be hard to tie it back to something that's definitive, but, you know, I think mm -hmm. Uh, organisations that are at this level of sophistication and doing that kind of thing, I think, you know, that they'll be um, very well regarded. They're not going to be, uh, I don't think there'll be too much scrutiny if, if you're getting down to this level of, uh, of measurement of emissions. Yep. Thank you. And then this category here is about waste disposal. And as Aleta mentioned earlier, this is one that could end up as a a scope one, depending on which way things go, you know, with the standards. But um, it's very much looking at, okay, once we've sold something, what happens at the end of its life? Is it is it recycled or is it put into landfill? And uh, or is it, if it's recycled, you know, what how many times can you reuse the, the particular product? Um, once you know when it's going to hit landfill, it's probably, you know, quite conceivable to get that information because the, the landfill or the waste management companies are very sophisticated. They've been reporting, you know, um, their emissions for many, many years under a bunch of different schemes. So, you know, if you can work out when your product ends up in landfill, then, you know, I reckon you'd be able to work out what the emission is. It's probably just a more a matter of what happens between when you sell it to when it ends up in that, that state. Um, but um, that'll be an interesting one just to keep an eye on where it ends up in the, you know, in the scheme of things. It may well become, you know, a bit more important. Thanks. Um, yeah, just primary, secondary. So you, I, I won't dwell too much on that, but to get the gist, it's, it's see what you can do as a preferred option. Okay, I'm going to hand back to the Queen of Leases, the letter. <laughs> You'll do this much better than I will. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much, Dylan, and thank you for stepping through those first cat the, the first few categories, categories nine to twelve. These are all interesting categories, the downstream categories, because it's so difficult to get the data because you're relying on 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 those customers, Dylan. So it's really interesting, and I'm just sitting and thinking, yeah, how do we navigate this? Yeah, you know, it's a really interesting one. You really need good relationships, and as you said last night, that's the one thing that came out of um, that sustainability and, and a retail um, event we had, um, you know, where everybody talked about relationships and people collaborating and collectively trying mm. to do the, the right thing. And so that was fun. Um, when we look at downstream leased asset, um, so this would be situations where the reporting entity or the entity here um, preparing the carbon footprint is actually the lessor. So we own this building and we're leasing it out. And so we, we're leasing it out to other entities. Um, and therefore, you know, what part of that usage of the property should be included in the landlords, the lessor's carbon um, footprint? So we receive payments from lessees. And what do we now do? So what we would say is um, included in your scope three, um, from these downstream leased assets, we would include scope one and scope two emissions of lessees. Um, and it will depend on the lessees consolidation approach. Um, you know, and as you know, on consolidation approach, this is where we're looking at boundaries. So we're really looking at um, the organizational boundaries um, and whether our leases are finance leases or operating leases. Um, so in this situation, if we are a landlord and we lease our property and we look at it from an accounting perspective and we say it's a finance lease, um, then it wouldn't be part of our operational boundary. But if I'm a lessor and I lease it out as an operating lease, um, so maybe only for two years and it's got a useful life of 20 years, in that scenario, this would definitely be within my operational boundary. So it's important to note um, when we looked at scope one and scope two, and we looked at leased assets, uh, we said we don't care whether it's finance leases or operating leases because the accounting standards have changed. 
And if you're a lessee, everything is a right of use asset, basically. However, where you're the lessor, and where we get to category 13, we're still with the old fashioned rules around whether we've got a finance lease or an operating lease. So that's just something that I wanted to call out up front. Again, then if we look at the data on the next slide, uh, there's primary data and secondary data. A primary data is always very specific. So it's site specific energy use data collected by utility bills or meters. And when you look at secondary data, if you can't find the primary data, it's now estimation of emissions based on industry average data. So we could say this is the energy use per floor space by building type. Um, so we make an estimate, apply our judgment. If we move on to category 14, this is where we look at franchises. Um, so if we've got an entity preparing a carbon footprint, and they operate uh, franchises, um, and those franchises are not included in scope one and scope two. Um, this is when we're thinking to what extent would that have to be included by the operating entity. So a franchise is a, a business operating structure under a license to sell or distribute another company's goods or services within a certain location. Um, so this category is if we are the franchisor, Similar to category 13, where we are the lessor, here we are the franchisor. We are the entity that provided the, the license to other entities to sell or distribute goods or services. Um, and they pay us in order to be able to do that. So royalties or a franchise fee. And um, so again, franchisors, similar to lessors, should account for emissions that occur from the operation of the franchises. Um, so it's only the scope one and the scope two emissions of the franchisees, right? So it's a very um, similar uh, concept. Yes, yeah, Dylan. Say, we, we, we do um, a carbon audit for an organisation that's a franchisor, but they've made the choice to include that because the wider market probably doesn't realise that there's franchisees and franchisors. They just think of it as one organisation, right? So if someone comes yeah. into that, outlet and go oh it's, isn't it great that you're carbon neutral then the franchisee can go yeah it is great and knowing that their data is included yes. in that footprint and an offset depending on you know whatever's left um but I thought that was actually a good way of looking at it is you know from a materiality perspective what what's an outsider looking in i mean everyone knows that mcdonald's are franchisees and all stand alone but in this particular case I, even yeah. I didn't know that they were franchisors and franchisees, so it's actually a good kind of test apply of materiality side of things. Absolutely. Yeah. And again, it's a good example of collaboratively working to an outcome and not trying to do this individually where it gets really hard. Um, again, it's similar to lessors again, site specific data is the primary data, the preference, and if you cannot get that, we can make an estimate based on an industry average. If we move on to the last category around investments, um, all of these categories have a lot of overlap with setting the boundaries in my experience. Um, so if you look at investments, um, so this could be your entity doing the carbon footprint calculation or the reporting entity, uh, they could operate a number of investments. It could be equity investments, it could be debt investments, it could be project finance. Um, and the question is, to what extent should that be included in our scope three calculation? Now you can see in all of these slides, we have there not included in scope one or scope two, because if all of this was in your boundary, it would have usually clearly been scope one and two. So we are thinking um, a little bit further afield in a way. Um, so this category is applicable to investors. Um, so that's companies that make an investment with the objective of making a profit, um, and it's companies that provide financial services. Um, now, these investments are downstream scope three categories um, because the provision of the capital or the provision of the financing is a service provided by the reporting entity. So we provide a service to downstream entities the same way we sell goods to customers downstream. So that's why they fit within that, this category. We look at the next slide. Um, 
I've included some extracts from the greenhouse gas protocol because I think it's it's a good link and, and just to explain exactly what we're talking about. Um, there are certain of these emissions that it is required to be included in your calculation for category 15 and some of them are optional. So if you look at the required um, equity investments um, that's made by the reporting entity um, using their own capital, um, you know, equity investments in subsidiaries, we have to include equity investments in associated companies and in equity investments in joint ventures. Um, so again, those are terminology that come from an accounting perspective. And then they would say, in general, companies in the financial services sector should account for emissions from these equity investments in scope one and two um, by using equity share consolidation approach. So there's this linkage with the consolidation method that you use. So basically saying, remember, it's the reporting entity, it's subsidiaries, it's associates and joint ventures in general. However, if you get to the optional list, uh, which is the next slide, you'll find it interesting. So you can see here, this is an optional inclusion in the greenhouse gas protocol. So this would be debt investments without a known use of the proceeds, optional. Manage investments and client services, again, optional to include. And then also other investments or financial services. So often when we look at these, I think it's important to understand what mandatorily have to be included, what is optional, and usually initially entities would try and exclude this just to bed down all the other mandatory aspects before they start to look at this. Usually these are also optional because it's so hard to get the data. Um, so just wanted to flag it's not an all in all out. You, you can um, have a look at what's mandatory and what's optional. And then again, um, in order to the, you know to uh, look at the the calculation method, uh, whether we use specific approach or the average data method, it depends on whether your investee will be able to provide you that scope one and scope two data or not. Um, if they can provide it, that would be the best. If not, we use an average data method. On the next slide. And this is again, this is looking at project finance and debt instruments, similar. Can the investee company provide that data or not? That will dictate which method we use. And again, examples of primary data. Primary data would be site-specific energy use or emissions data. Secondary data, um, estimated emissions based on industry average data. And the previous decision trees, when would we use primary data? When would we use secondary data? Aleta, just on that one too, I think it's worth thinking of, okay, um, I might not be a lender, but I might be a borrower. And if I'm a borrower, I might not be a reporting entity, but I might have decent size scope one and two emissions. In that case, the bank lends money to you might go, well, your material in our universe, can we talk to you about yeah. what you were doing with the money we've loaned you? You've bought a yeah. whole lot of vehicles or invested in something that has a lot of scope one emissions. That's where not only do we look at this GHG protocol and say, oh, that's for someone else. It might well be us because we're on the the other end of the, or the other side of the equation. So think of it from that perspective as well, I think. Uh, and Dylan, I think it's, it's a good point you're raising because if you look at um, IFRS S2 and the appendix to IFRS S2, where they refer to the SASB disclosures, for financial institutions, there's a, a mandatory disclosure that they have to disclose um, the emissions associated with borrowers. Because for financial institutions, that is critical information. We want financial mm -hmm. institutions to provide funds to entities that have low emissions or committed uh, to, to lowering their emissions. Um, so again, there's that link. Um, yes, the greenhouse gas protocol says one thing, but there's an overlap on what financial institutions will be required to report on, which, which is an interesting to look at those industry standards. 
I thought to round off our discussion around um, measuring scope one, two, and three, what about a quick look at intensity factors? And what I've done on the next slide is extracted the carbon footprint of BDI Australia 2023 and 2022. So it's from our 2023 report. And we've uh, summarized, um, you know, we've got a column for 2022 emissions, 23 emissions, and then year on year, the percentage movement. Uh, we've split it between scope one, scope two, and scope three. You can see we've only included the categories in scope three that was material to BDI Australia. Um, and even in scope one, we only included refrigerants because we didn't have the other categories being relevant. So um, it's not a long table with a lot of zeros. We only disclosed what was relevant to our business. Um, and the other interesting thing that you'll see here um, looking at our emissions in total over the two year, you can see the movement, um, but we also have a percentage column for 2022 and 2023. So you can see there, if you look at scope three and the category subtotal for scope three, 96.9% um, of all of our emissions in 2022 were actually scope three. And in 2023, 96.8%. So for BDO Australia, if we want to reduce, and we want to, by the way, we've committed to reduce our carbon footprint, and we've set goals globally. If we want to reduce our carbon footprint, we have to focus on scope three, absolutely, because that is this huge part of our carbon footprint. And so you can see for us, our supply chain, our suppliers are incredibly important in order to reduce our carbon footprint. What's interesting at the bottom, we've also included our emissions intensity. <clears throat> and we've worked it out um, based on an average full-time equivalent. So we've got an intensity per full-time equivalent. We've also looked at our revenue and we've worked out our intensity per Aussie dollar, million Aussie dollar, and you can see the intensity there. So for example, if you look at the intensity per a million um, Aussie dollars, uh, it went from 68.84 in 2022 to 60.78 in 2023. Um, if you look at our intensity factor per full-time equivalent, um, you can also see there's been a, a slight reduction, even though there was an increase in the number of full-time equivalents. So it just puts it in perspective. Instead of just looking at emissions year on year, um, remembering that organizations grow, um, hopefully revenue increases, number of staff increase, and therefore that intensity factor puts it in perspective. Now, very important actually on the one on the next slide is what do we do with those intensity factors? So what would it mean for you if, for example, um, let's take an example, an entity pays BDO Australia $50,000 for tax or audit or advisory services. Um, what would the associated scope three emissions be um, that would therefore impact your scope three, right? So the fact that BDO provides a service to you would have a flow on effect to you. So for 2022, if you've spent that $50,000 with us and you calculate your carbon footprint and we would sit in scope three, category one, um, and if you apply those intensity factors, you would see 3.442 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent would be included in your carbon footprint. And in 2023, because our intensity factor is a bit lower, it will be 3.039 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent. If an entity, and we've done this calculation um, and a, a, a wonderful member of our team, Ramona, helped me this morning to get all the appropriate factors, Dylan, because I wanted a bit of a comparison. Um, so Ramona is actually in Dylan's team. If the entity used Australian averages, um, so the entity said, I've, sp I've, I've spent $50,000 on a professional services firm in Australia. Uh, I don't know what BDO Australia's intensity factor is, so I'm gonna use an industry average. Um, for 2023, that industry average 
would have worked out to 3.5 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is a, a, a slightly more than what we have um, for 2023 for BDI Australia, the 3.039. So often these industry averages um, could be a bit higher than the actuals of your suppliers, especially if your suppliers are committing to targets and tracking against targets. So an industry average over time will be much higher than that specific supplier. Um, if you use global averages, and Dylan, this was a bit of an eye opener for me, um, because if you go to global averages, so if you use a professional services firm, whether in Australia, America, the UK, anywhere globally, and you apply that global factor that will take in whatever happens throughout the globe, um, in this situation, it would have given you 17.254 um, tons of carbon dioxide equivalent, which is much larger, larger than using an Australian average or using BDO, uh, BDO specific um, intensity factor. So you can see the selection of the intensity factor has a huge impact on the carbon footprint. And the closer you can get to the entity, the better. So you use global quite high. You go to Australia, it looks better. You go to the entity, it looks better, um, especially if they set targets and work towards those targets. Um, so to me, um, actually last night, I thought I should do something like this just as an example. You might say a little, but you know, 3.4 or 3.5, or, um, or 17.2, that doesn't sound big, right? But remember, we're just looking at a spend of $50,000 a year. The spend, um, if you look at your expenditure in your p and it, it could be a huge difference. Um, so um, thank you to Ramona for, for helping me with that calculation. If we then look at the next slide, um, you know, key takeaways from that little example I've put together, is that entity specific factors would potentially lower, um, be lower than global or industry average emission factors, especially if your suppliers are looking at reducing their carbon footprint. Um, so if they reduce their carbon footprint um, and they set targets, we expect it to be lower. Entities like BDO in Australia can reduce our carbon footprint if we obtain entity specific emission factors. So if we can go to all our suppliers and say, instead of using averages, which we've used in 2022 and 2023, we want to use entity specific factors, please give us your information. That could help us reduce our carbon footprint. And the third point, especially if our suppliers set targets and over time reduce their carbon footprint, that would be really good for us. So this is how it pushes through the whole economy. Shannon, maybe the next section, the last section, the importance of engaging your suppliers and customers. And I think Dylan and I have said this over and over today, but again, maybe a little bit of a visual representation. And Dylan, this was after last night's panel discussion. I thought about this one, that mm. you've got your suppliers from whom you buy goods and or services, and they come into you, this reporting entity, and then, you sell your goods or services to your customers. And really what we're doing here in scope three around upstream, the suppliers and downstream, the customers, is we're thinking holistically, how can all of us together make a difference? And I think that's what the retailers discussed so well last night. Um, so this relationship with suppliers and encouraging, educating suppliers on measuring carbon footprint, setting targets, reporting to you, but also engaging with customers, if possible. I know it's harder, but if, poss if, if possible, um, on measuring carbon footprint, setting targets. The other thing that is interesting is some of our clients are saying to us, us um, you know, the people putting pressure on us is not only investors. It's not just staff who want us to do the right thing. Actually, our customers have expectations of us, right? So your customers might turn around and say, hang on, um, 
we would only want to buy from you if you're doing the right thing. So yes, you want some information from them, but equally they want some information and commitment from you. So this supply chain can, you know, that arrow can go either way actually. And then on the next slide, I'm coming back to one of the um, slides. I think we've started the webinar series with in 2023. And that is that the whole business problem or opportunity is around access, access to capital, access to markets, customers, and access to people to work in the business. And the more we think about it, the more I read about it, the, the more I hear people speak about it, this rings true. And then finally, when we move on to our next um, or our last slide, what does this mean for your organization? Having listened to all of this, Again, where do you fit into the economic system? Where do you sit? Who are your investors? Who are your customers? Who are your suppliers? Where do you sit? Um, who are those key stakeholders around you in your economic system? Do you think those stakeholders, any of them, will demand emissions information? Would they demand target setting and target tracking? Um, and if you think any of them would demand that information, are you ready to provide this information to those stakeholders? And then finally, a call to action, please, let's get started. Please reach out to Dylan and I. Um, we love working together and we love working with you in a collaborative way to tackle this problem. And then um, Shannon, the last few slides, we don't have to look at all of this. It's just the, the tools and resources available on our website to get you thinking, an activation checklist, TCFD training, um, a lot of resources available to you. But most importantly, please reach out to Dylan and I, and let's get started on your carbon accounting journey. Dylan, thank you very much. We had fun today, a lot of technical difficulties, but okay. we <laughs> overcame <laughs> those. <laughs> we yeah. did survive it. Um, so we've got one webinar for the year and we hope um, that that one, no technology issues, Dylan, um, and we end the, the year on a high. So in two weeks time, yeah. we'll have our final webinar um, talking about decarbonization strategies. Thank you, Dylan, and thank you everybody for attending. Uh, thanks everyone.